back to Otaku, the show where Otaku talk about Otaku topics. And I am very, very privileged to have with me Helen McCarthy on Skype, the, art, the author of The Art of Osamu Tezuka, God of Manga, as well as a number of other books about anime and manga. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Brent. It's nice to be here. Oh, it's, a, it's great to have you here. And now, I, I know just from The Art of Osamu Tezuka that you're very familiar with uh, just the history of manga. And I know we talked before the show about talking about uh, the history of manga sort of pre-Tezuka and how, I mean, you know, Tezuka does become kind of the byword of manga and we hear all this stuff about, you know, the god of manga and the grandfather of manga and so forth. But it really, really goes back, you know, much further than that, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. In fact, um, there's so much discussion about where manga begins mm. among serious manga scholars with a much yeah. bigger claim to manga scholarship than I have <laughs> that I think you can you can go a little too far. I mean, if you look at a wonderful book um, called One Thousand Years of Manga by Brigitte Koyama Richard, mm -hmm. who is a, a, fr a French scholar married to a Japanese, um, she postulates that manga actually starts um, with uh, Buddhist scrolls where um, comical narrative is used mm -hmm. to turn people towards spiritual ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Isao Takahata, for example, has also, who is a great expert, which not many people know, on early mm -hmm. Japanese scrolls and embroidery, oh, cool. has also argued that in the way that Japanese narrative scrolls and Japanese narrative embroideries are done, you can trace the roots of manga. But to be honest, I think that's like saying the bio tapestry is the origin of the Western comic. Yeah. You can make a case but it stretches the threads very, very thin. But yeah. that's, that's enough fabric metaphors because I didn't come here to talk about embroidery. Um, where I think we actually start um, seeing modern manga emerging is quite some way back in the 1860s. Uh, uh, Hokusai? Uh, no, post Hokusai, although Hokusai okay. used the word manga very widely and popularized yeah. it in its, its relatively modern sense. Yeah. There were people using it before him, uh, but okay. um, where I see it happening is when foreigners start to come to Japan, because uh, J Japan already had this fascinating tradition of popular art, of cheap street yeah. art, woodblock prints that were sold to a literate, savvy cultivated middle class mm -hmm. who were interested in art, interested in graphics, had a bit of disposable income. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the merchant class that had been created in a sense by Japan's isolation right through the, the, the shogunate had been, mm -hmm. been the first consumers of manga. Mm -hmm. But we still weren't at narrative comics. Mm -hmm. We had pictures being used as illustrations for stories with little blocks of text, but we hadn't arrived at narratives that were told mainly by pictures. But in 1861, a young British guy came to Japan, a guy called Charles Wergman. Mm. Now, Wergman was, um, he was a second son of a well-to-do British family, and he was an artist of some skill and repute. And he came with a commission in his back pocket from the Illustrated London News to be an artist journalist and send back reports from this new frontier, because Japan then had only just opened to the West. Mm -hmm. So everybody was interested. Everybody wanted to know what it was like. And because Wordman was a good classically trained artist, and at that stage, there wasn't, a, in fact, I don't think photographs had been used at all in London in the press, mm -hmm. you had to be able to send sketches back as well. So the fact that he could say, I can go and write your reports, and I can also send my own sketches for your engravers, mm -hmm. that gave him an edge. So he went to Japan and he started up all kinds of little businesses to keep money coming in. Um, and one of the businesses he started was a little satirical journal called Japan Punch. Oh, Based wow. English Punch. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lovely kind of, if you look at some of the, you can, you can find bits and pieces on the internet. It's got a sort of fanzine feel. Mm -hmm. it, it's really gorgeous. But he began using Western style satirical cartoons. Now, at the same time, he was teaching Western style painting to Japanese who'd realized that Western style painting was going to be all the vogue. Mm -hmm. And if they could get a handle on this style, they could make sales at home. Ah. Um, so um, they began to see, you know, what he was doing in cartoon terms and thought, now this is interesting. Where could we take this? And so Wergman began to, to teach cartooning as well. And in fact, still to this day, on the anniversary of his death, 
at the foreigner's graveyard in Yokohama where he's buried. Japanese manga and fine artists burn incense and hold a little ceremony. Oh, how nice. Um, which, you know, more than 100 years after, after mm. the guy died, is, mm -hmm. is beautiful and yeah. says how important they think he is. Mm -hmm. And then other foreigners, of course, were pouring into the country, and in particular a guy called Georges Bigot, who was a mm. Frenchman. And like Workman, he stayed in Japan, settled down, married a Japanese girl. And he also started a satirical magazine, mm -hmm. uh, because there were more and more expats who wanted to read stuff in, in their own languages, because they didn't read so easily in Japanese, and there was a big demand. And with all these influences washing around, people began to look at Western-style satirical and narrative cartooning. Mm -hmm. But where it really began to get exciting for me was when an Australian kid called Frank Nankivell graduated back home in Oz, 22 years old, and he thought to himself, right, I've graduated in fine art, I've learned everything Australia can teach me, I'm going to have a gap year. And then I'm going to, on the way, I'm going to go to France and I'm going to study in France because, of wow. course, France then was the centre yeah. of France, Italy, Spain, the centres of the art world. Mm -hmm. So Nankiville set out from Australia with his savings in his pocket and like most kids on gap years then and since, he ran out of money when he got to Yokohama. <laughs> so he had to get a job. Mm -hmm. And the job he got was on an expat magazine called Box of Curios. Mm. And, you know, young guy, and you know what it's like, you go and hang out in, in the local bars, and you meet other young guys, and, and you pick up the language, and you get talking. He met a young guy called Rakuten Kitazawa. Mm -hmm. um, that, well, that was, that was his pseudonym, and, and, and Rakuten was, I think, 17 or 18 when he met mm -hmm. Nankivell, and Nankivell was about 22, 23. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a certain amount of hero worship for this, you know, sophisticated foreign guy who was that bit older, mm -hmm. um, and there was a certain amount of interest in all the stuff he was bringing with him, mm. and there was an absolute fascination with cartooning. Wow. And he began to learn as much as he could from Nankiville. Mm. And Nankiville realized that on Box of Curios, there was not a single Japanese member of surf. Uh. So as he was leaving to carry on with, his, with his, um, his journey, he said, you know, here's this kid, he's good, he's sharp, you should take him on. And as a result, Kitazawa became the first native Japanese to work for a foreign publication in Japan. <laughs> Um, and Kitazawa became a really brave uh, political cartoonist oh. and satirist. But he also became, through his links with Nankiville, who went to America, by the way, not France, and became very famous there. He, through his links with Nankiville, he got passionate about American comics. And he, as he progressed in his career, persuaded a Japanese newspaper to start printing American comics in translation. Mm -hmm. And he produced narrative comic strips. And so way before the, 9th, the 20th century, let alone the 21st century, we've got foreigners coming into Japan, meeting local culture, bringing in influences, and Japanese thinking, we can use the way these guys do things to change the way we do things a bit, and we can make something new. Mm. And from Kitazawa, and Kitazawa's successes and the people he trained, came the cartoonists whose comics influenced Osamu Tezuka and his generation in the 1930s and early 1940s. Wow. That is it, it was a fabulous journey. I mean, it's mm. such a ride. <laughs> yeah, I mean, boy, isn't that just an adventure novel just waiting to be written? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm amazed that more people both in Japan and in Britain haven't picked this up because it was such a wild time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people always think of the big political movements going on, you know, yeah. Japan opening up, trade opening up, commerce opening up, and here are these guys just starting to make comics. <laughs> and that's turned out to be, 150, 200 years later, mm -hmm. possibly the most influential thing Japan's selling to the West at the moment, aside from robotics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So now, how did comics evolve from that point? Well, as people picked up the idea of the narrative comic, and as more and more Western comics were brought over and translated, um, more and more Japanese started to make comics. And in fact, there was a, a, a manga artist's union quite early on in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And a guy called Ippe Okamoto, who was... was trained by Kitazawa and very heavily influenced by Kitazawa, made comics obsessively. But you've got to remember, back then, comics weren't this, like, ghetto form. Mm -hmm. 
mm, that right. many people in fine art regard them as now. Mm. I mean, people like Okamoto. Okamoto was a trained theatre designer. He was an essayist. He was a novelist. Mm -hmm. He was shacked up with a red-hot Buddhist poet chick <laughs> who also wrote about religious theory. He mm. was kind of an avant-garde intelligentsia soldier. So his making comics was experimenting with a really edgy new art form. Oh, um, gotcha. At a time when people were really interested in all this new stuff piling in from the West. Mm -hmm. And he made some fabulous comics. I mean, Okamoto is an amazing, amazing artist in so many ways in his own right and had a big influence on the culture. And other people began to step into the culture as well. And, and bit by bit, I mean, one, one particular guy that I find very interesting is called Bontara Shaka. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bontara Shaka had a truly fascinating career. Um, he's hardly known in European languages except that almost every website says that he has a big influence on Osama with Tezuka, which he does. He was one of Tezuka's favorite mangaka. Mm -hmm. But he was working for a company that was set up called Nakamura Manga Library. Mm -hmm. um, and Shaka was actually a second careerist. He mm -hmm. um, started off as a salaryman, mm -hmm. uh, made quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm got interested and started making manga at the age of 40. Wow. And his debut manga was published by Nakamura and it was hugely popular from 1933. And from then on, he kept up a really steady flow of stories. Mm. Uh, he worked, um, he did 28 titles in the Nakamura Manga Library from 1933 when Tezuka was five mm. to 1943 when Tezuka was 15. Wow. So he, really, he was kind of the formative cartoonist of Tezuka's years. Yeah. And all those people who say that Tezuka's round lines and round eyes came entirely from Disney obviously haven't looked at Shaka. Uh. Um, they did, I mean, Disney was an influence because mm -hmm. Tezuka came from this very cosmopolitan family. His father was an early adopter of all things geek. Mm -hmm. um, and being a salaryman in a good job from a decent family, his father earned good money, so the family had the latest bits of tech kit. Okay. And his father bought a little um, projector, home projector, when they were still quite new and edgy, mm -hmm. and bought in films to mm -hmm. show at home to um, his family and to their friends at regular film nights. So Tezuka knew Disney's work from fairly early on. Mm -hmm. And of course they went to a cinema. But Shaka's work was just as big an influence. And if you look at Shaka's work, his line is very rounded and very warm and very natural. You can see so many affinities there with the other things Tezuka was picking up from Disney. But Shaka, like all the other mangaka that Tezuka was reading, and he refers to many of them, um, had a big, fat, full stop in the form of the Pacific War, the Second World War. Oh, yeah. um, when many mangaka did collaborate, but mm -hmm. for the perfectly valid reason, <laughs> that A, many of them did believe it was their duty to support their country in time mm -hmm. of war. Mm -hmm. B, they all knew that if they didn't collaborate, they wouldn't get printed because mm -hmm. the government controlled the paper supplies and yeah, the presses. Absolutely. And C, people who didn't collaborate had a tendency to get sent to the front lines. Yeah. So it was, it was a tough time for manga artists. Some people stopped working. And for older mangaka, obviously, that was the end of their career. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, when the Americans and the Allies came in in 45, for many mangaka and many publishers, there was an issue that people who had been known collaborators were not encouraged to work. Uh, yeah. um, because they were considered beyond the pale by, mm -hmm. by, by the Allies. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure how Shaka managed it. I think because most of his stuff wasn't propagandist. Most of his stuff stuck with history, retellings of history, retellings of, of famous stories, children's stories. He managed to avoid the worst of the propaganda trap, and he was able to keep working after the war for quite some time in the new magazines that sprang up. And so there was this continuity, but we don't perceive it, and most of the kids who were Tezuka fans didn't perceive it because they were born in the war years or the post-war years. They'd never experienced this astonishing richness of manga from the 30s and early 40s that Tezuka and his generation had experienced. They just saw the, the one magazine that kept printing through the war with its crappy propaganda stories. They had no idea what great comics were. Now, how, I'll, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry you, you got it. I was just going to say Tez, Tezuka kind of 
drawing on his memories, made it his mission to bring them great comics. But because we didn't look back before the war, because historians in, in the West didn't look back before the war, we didn't realize at first that that was, he, was what he was doing. We thought he was inventing. And what he was actually doing was forming a bridge in a tradition. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So that, <laughs> how was how manga being distributed at this point, in time, especially in like the 30s and the 40s? Was it mostly the manga magazines, the Akahan and things like that? Um, individual books were quite popular, and although mm. although the Akahan were popular, the rental libraries were popular after the war, before the war, it was mostly stories, not dedicated manga magazines, mm. but magazines that mixed stories, articles, features, and manga. Gotcha. And of course, like, like American and British newspapers, um, there were funny pages in mm. Japanese newspapers, there were comic strips in there. Mm. Um, Yonkoma, the four-panel four strip is still a really strong tradition in Japan, and a lot of contemporary series, for example, k have come out of that mm. tradition and mm. been very powerful. Sazai-san, um, the great oh, post book right. comes out of that tradition. Mm. Um, but, but that means that before the manga, mag the solely dedicated manga magazine started up, there was a tradition of magazines with manga, and as Nakamura approved, there was a market for individual story volumes. Mm. So the manga market was really pretty well set up. You can see the outlines of its modern form mm -hmm. while Tezuka was a boy. That's amazing. So, um, so, you know, Tezuka comes in here and it's you know, one of the tragedies of World War II is just how much it upended, you know, so many things in Japanese culture. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's just, you know, fascinating to, to look into. But, um, so he comes in, I mean, how many of those older mangaka were able to continue? I mean, we know there were a few. Was there a significant number? Quite a significant number were able to continue, and many of them did it by, of course, many of them originally worked under pen names. Sure. Uh, so they were able to adopt new pen names and reinvent themselves all shiny and clean after the war. Mm -hmm. um, a number of the editors and publishers it's surprising how many women in Japan suddenly set up publishing businesses in the post-war years um, because their husbands weren't allowed to own businesses, having owned business, businesses that supported the former government, but they could work for their wives' businesses, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, quite a number of that starts off. So there is quite a strong continuity there. There are a number of older mangaka still working and still providing encouragement to people like Tezuka. Um, but because of the bombings, which were very, very extensive, because of the fire bombings, which are actually more extensive and in some ways more destructive than the nuclear bombings, yeah. uh, because of Japan's historic um, lack of preservation of early paper culture, well, most countries didn't preserve early paper culture, actually. It wasn't just Japan. Um, also, because, of course, in wartime, every scrap that can be recycled is recycled. Yep. There just wasn't an awful lot of survival mm -hmm. of pre-war manga. And uh, one of the interesting things now is how scholars like Isao Shimizu, who's done a lot of astonishing work in, in, in Japanese, um, in early manga, are gradually rediscovering, restating this wonderful history. And it's, it's being studied in Japan, it's being um, re-evaluated in Japan, young mangaka are more and more aware of it. So Japan has been reclaiming this area of history since, um, I suppose, since the late 80s, really, mid to late 80s. Um, but a great deal of it just hasn't survived, uh, like a great deal of, of early film history. Mm, and yeah. so I get terribly excited whenever I find a snippet in a Japanese newspaper that says this case of film or, or, or that box of old comics has been found in a, a yard sale somewhere or an old house that was being pulled down. You know, there, there is still stuff to be rediscovered, and that's very exciting. Absolutely. Now, what was the international reaction, um, especially pre-war, to Japanese comics? Were folks aware of this going on uh, outside of Japan? Do you know, I haven't done any, any serious reading at all on um, outside of Japan, but I honestly don't think they were. Yeah. The first paper, academic paper with a reference that I've been able to trace to manga, yeah. was done in 1977 Wow! at the University of Texas, mm -hmm. um, in English that is. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are references that are fractionally earlier, mm 
mm. in Italy and France, but only fractionally. Mm. Really, we're not talking, I think, about the Western world having made any major um, incursions into manga mm. until the 80s. Yeah. Um, and obviously the language was a major barrier. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you think about the immediate post-war years and the, the reconstruction years, there were not that many Westerners who didn't work in politics or the military, mm -hmm. who yeah. learned Japanese. Um, and people like Donald Ritchie, of course, and Fred Schoet started a great wave of Japanese studies, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that around this very interesting period when... Um, Things were, as you say, a lot of Japanese culture was, I don't think wiped out, but buried deep yeah. underground. And as it began to emerge, there were not that many foreigners studying it with, 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 with you know, real interest and real depth. And so now we've got all that work to do. Um, and luckily the Japanese are doing so much of it for us and, and, and getting so excited about it. It's a really exciting period to be a student of Japanese popular culture. Yeah.